Welcome to the very first episode of 2022 for A Day Talk for Educators Live, the show for the unsung heroes of education. I'm your host, Kwame South Mensa, back for another fantabulous year. And if you are a returning listener or viewer of the podcast, I welcome you back. And I hope that this year you'll enjoy some fresh innovative new content coming out of the podcast and if you're a listener or viewer of the podcast welcome to 2022 and welcome to the podcast and i hope that you continue to be a subscriber and continue to follow us as we go along this new journey so first things first before we get to the main event if you are on youtube please make sure you hit that red subscribe button so you can get future notifications on new episodes of the podcast and other content. And we're also just thankful for any contributions that people are making financially to help us continue to build this platform. So if you're so inclined to give a donation, uh, we do accept them through Cash App and Venmo. If you use Cash App, uh, that'll be money sign ID talk for Ed. And if you are on the Venmo, the handle would be at Kwame SM. So that's K W A M E S M. Thank you. Now, a lot has gone on already in 2022 in these past few weeks. We've had rising cases of COVID. Um, the Omicron surge is as strong as it's ever been. We still have politicians utterly disrespecting educators and the work that we do and just overlooking our impact in society. That's something that is not new, but it's now further magnified with everything going on around COVID. So there's a lot going on um, in our system. And not to mention the fact that you have lots of school districts transitioning back to remote learning after the winter break because of the rise in COVID outbreaks with Omicron. So it's a tough time in the education world, but I'm just glad to be back speaking with you all and being in a community with you all because it's been a few weeks and I needed some time to recharge and reboot so that I could be my best for all of you. So let's go ahead and get started with our very first guest of the new year. She is currently in Singapore. She's an international educator, social justice advocate, and she is all about empowering students and even adults to just build their practices around social justice and, and just being change agents. Um, in their respective communities. And she just has a phenomenal story that I believe you all will, you know, leave here being inspired by. So I'm going to just stop talking and get our guest on. So without further ado, let's bring on Jessica Wei Huang to the show to talk with us about her journey, what's going on with her currently in Singapore, and, and just just talk about what's going on in education because there's a lot to, to discuss, as I mentioned. So I'm going to bring Jessica on and we're going to get started, people. Hello. Hi, good morning from Singapore. All right, well, good evening from the East Coast. <laughs> How are we doing? <laughs> oh, I'm doing great this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, well thank you for being on the podcast and for being the first guest of 2022. It's a distinct honor. <laughs> Thank you. Happy Gregorian New Year's to everybody listening. <laughs> yes. And I appreciate you putting out the Gregorian reference because even that is problematic. We need to acknowledge these other counters as well. <laughs> yeah, let's get started. So I know that you grew up in, in Arizona, you know, first generation Chinese American immigrant, but then you have ties to Vietnam and Taiwan. So just tell me about your upbringing and, and what ultimately brought you into the education field? 
Yeah, thank you. Like you said, I'm first generation Chinese American, and my family, you know, I think is part of the large Chinese diaspora in the world. And so my mother's family is from Taiwan, and my father's family is from Vietnam. Although they are, you know, both families ethnically Chinese, I think we're not a monolith. Even the Chinese American community. So both of my parents immigrated to the states. I was born and raised in Arizona. In predominantly a white middle class community, and my mother was actually really influential in shaping my views on justice. She worked as a social worker in the working class neighborhoods and communities of color in Arizona, and so I think as as an Asian American, that was different, right?、Um, she understood systems of oppression, and she understood that people had less and had more. Not purely because of like our individual work ethics, but that there there were systems involved in in our lot in life. And I grew up in a, with a very diverse friend group across Latin America, Mexican Americans, Black Americans, but I did not have a lot of Asian friends. And you know, I think it was a lot because I didn't have the room to really develop my Asian American identity, and so I rejected that. Part of myself. I didn't want to learn Chinese. I didn't want to go to Chinese school,、um, and and I was a pretty. I, I would say I, I battled a lot with my parents in many aspects. So、uh, there was no way they were going to make me do something I didn't want to. And you know, I think for a lot of even young people of color now, there were not a lot of alternatives for me to see myself in different arenas and media books in my community. And I guess my journey took me to college, as、um, I was expected to do. So there was never a question whether I was going to go to college or not. And when I graduated, I landed, you know, a well-paying technology job in Washington D.C. And I think part of part of the reason I landed that job was just that I was the I was the oldest child、um, in a first-generation immigrant family, and I I knew that I needed to get a well-paying job. It really didn't matter if I liked it. It was kind of my duty to my parents. After living in D.C. and having that job for about a year,、uh, September 11th, 2001 happened, and you know, without going too much into the impact, we all know how chaotic and deeply traumatizing it was for the whole nation, but also lifting up a lot of systemic inequalities in in our country and in our world, as many. Crisis incidences do so. At the end of that year, I I quit my job and I decided that I wanted to be a teacher, and it was mainly because for a lot of the time I was working in corporate America, I was oftentimes the only woman or person of color in the room, and I think that you know we're held to higher standards, right? We're either tokenized or、um, we're expected to be better than our white colleagues. So I really wanted to change that. I've been teaching since 2002. I started as a middle school math and science teacher, and then went on to teach high school science, and then was had the privilege to be the leader and principal of June Jordan School for Equity in San Francisco. It's a small public high school、um, for seven years, and then the last three years I've been in Asia, in Taiwan, and now Singapore. Wow! Look at that journey. That's that's awesome, and we'll touch on. Uh, the June Jordan School a little later, because as I was doing my research, I was like, "Wow, they're doing some phenomenal things!" Like、they、this、are. is a school、they、that、are. I wish, yeah, like this is a school that I wish I had taught in, you know, early in my career. This is a school I wish But, I had gone to. Right. As a child, right. Well, you, yeah, yeah, for sure. But I know you're fortunate to spend、um, many years at the school, especially during the the formative years. When it was still trying to build an identity as far as what type of school they wanted to be, but we'll get into that. I do want to touch on something you mentioned regarding rejecting your your Asian American identity at a young、mm-hmm. age, and I can relate to that as Ghanaian American. So both my parents they grew up in Ghana, West Africa, and growing up in the late '80s, early '90s, you know, I had I was subjected to a lot of You know, jokes about Africa, and I dealt with the colorism because I was so much darker than everybody、yeah. in my class. 
And it just got to the point where I started to internalize all these negative messages that were coming from my peers, most of whom were black. I wasn't really getting it from my white peers. It was mostly from my black peers, which was even more detrimental, right? So I know that's how my rejection was fueled. So I'm wondering, based on how you grew up, was your rejection of your age identity fueled by similar messaging from peers and, and maybe some other people? I think it was both, right? But my community, I think, was predominantly white, middle class. And so I think growing up, especially for female youth, we are ingrained to think about, you know, our external beauty. So I think part of it was also just buying into Western ideals of beauty. I deeply remember um, there was an, there was an incident on the playground when I was in elementary school and I used to, I used to speak Chinese at home in English at school, right? In elementary school before I stopped speaking Chinese and only spoke English to my parents. But there was an incident on the playground where I accidentally spoke Chinese instead of English. And I was really, you know, and these were to my friends and just the reaction of what did you say? You know, and, and trying to make the sounds and feeling deeply ashamed that I had accidentally spoken, right? My home language. And then I think on the other side of it, just I was good at school. I wasn't the best and I wasn't the worst. Um, I was always kind of knew I needed to get good grades, but it, I didn't get that much pressure from my teacher, from my parents. It was never said, but I think it was always felt that I was expected to do well in school, right, as, as one of the only Asians in class. And actually, there was another student named Jessica Wong. Her and I were the only Asians within that class. I think there were maybe one or two Filipino students, but the teachers all thought we were sisters, right? We, we went to school from, K, from kindergarten to sixth grade together. Wow. So I, I think that was, I always think that was hilarious. Like it was a little joke that we played on them accidentally, right? They were like, wait, wait. But I, I think I always felt that the teachers expected me to be the model minority. And so I would oftentimes actually pretend that I wasn't doing well or pretend that I didn't understand in order to reject that identity, right? So just to be clear, that wasn't an expectation that you felt from your parents, but rather from your teachers in elementary school. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So let's stay on my minority myth for a second. And we've talked about this in previous episodes of this podcast uh, with other educators from the um, AAPI community and and they've had their stories, you know, about what it is. But I'm wondering, because you are abroad in Singapore and the my minority myth manifests itself in similar ways, sometimes in different ways. So I'm wondering, based on your experience, both in the States and also abroad, do you feel that the my minority myth manifests itself more? Is it more pronounced in American schools compared to international school spaces? Just mm. from your observation. I think it's currently easier to talk about it within the American context, mm. right? It's a term that at least the Asian American community has really done a lot of work around education and, and fighting for. And the model minority myth was born out of a history of xenophobia in North America, right? It was, um, I was doing some research on this because I do a support group for Asian Pacific Islander international educators online on a monthly basis. And, and one of our topics was really looking at stereotypes and its impact on our identity. The first time it was written about was in a New York Times article in 1966. And the reporter used the idea of the model minority in order to praise Japanese Americans for bouncing back from their illegal internment. And so, I mean, historically, it's been used by white supremacy, right, to pit Asian communities against black and brown communities in the United States. And I think it's been internalized by a lot of folks from the Asian American community as somehow striving towards this success, right, 
that that's going to get our community somewhere. But in fact, we, we still experience racism to this day and, and even worse to some matters. I, I think that it's the idea of the model minority is much more prevalent in international schools than people realize. And I think that there is this excuse that the model minority myth is a stereotype that is just westernized or just comes, you know, is just American. But our university systems are, you know, it's like this industrial complex of the university system that, as you know, right, controls all of education internationally. Yes. And so I think especially working in Taiwan and in Singapore, there is this still ingrained strong idea in international, in the international community of what success looks like, especially for Asian students. And so Asian students all over the world have internalized this identity. And I think not talking about the root of it is what's causing a lot of mental health issues in our schools, right? Our students are feeling it, but they can't name it. And I think the other thing to mention is that I hear a lot of educators saying that, oh, it's the parents, right? Or it's the culture. But if you go back just one generation, you don't have to go back that far, right? A lot of our families in international schools right now are like first generation, second generation. I think families that have maybe gone abroad and then come back right? In, in Taiwan, there's a lot of families that have done that. And so the students hold international passports. And so their parents have had to kind of buy into the model minority myth in order to achieve success. And they see that as maybe the only way for their kids. And it's not to blame them for perpetuating this idea, but it's, it's about actually talking about where it came from, talking with parents about the harm that it's causing kids, and also just giving room for kids to talk about how it impacts their identities and looking at the historical nature of where these stereotypes come from. And I actually have another question about my minority myth. So with regard to that, is it a myth that's more tied to Eastern Asian communities, Mm. like Japanese, Koreans, Chinese, um, as opposed to uh, South Asian communities, like maybe India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. Because typically when we talk about that, it's usually associated with the Eastern Asian community. So I'm wondering if it's something, if it's applied to other communities as well. Yeah, I don't want to speak for the Southeast Asian community because I, I don't identify as that community. I think right. the issue is we serve a lot of Singaporean Indian families, and I teach a lot of Indian identified students. And so I think that South Asians, the reason I think the model minority myth does impact them in the same way is because of immigration laws in the United States, right? Okay. And so a lot of A lot of first generation, second generation immigrants can have been able to only get visas or work visas because they're college educated. And so that perpetuates the myth, right, from from the white American side of 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 who our communities are. And I think that for Southeast Asian communities, you know, Indonesians, Filipinos, Cambodian, Hmong, I think that there are other stereotypes that are different. And, And I think the only reason I know that is because we have such a diverse group of API educators that that we hold support groups for. I don't think a lot of American, well, I'm an American, but white Americans understand that our communities are not a monolith. I think the problem is that our communities have been politicized um, to be a monolith. And so there are low-income Asian Americans, there are high-income Asian Americans, but the racism still exists. And so our policies don't support the communities in America that are Asian that that also need support and that are suffering from structural racism. There is a Washington school district that categorized Asian students who scored too high as white students. And that was actually the article title, Scored Too High, which is so telling, right? Like when a group of students of color do too well in a system that wasn't designed for them, then we will categorize them as white. Mm. And, I, and I think there might be 
some people in the Asian American community that might say, oh, that's a success, right? But I think when you look at things in a larger systemic way, that might be a success for one or two students, but it's not a success for our communities. And I think that's part of the problem because when it comes to statistics and data, if the data is not disaggregated, it's like, okay, everybody's in this one group. Everybody's in the Asian group and they're not separated by the different subgroups within the community. Right. And it just causes these messages and it causes, you know, confusion and, and, and even some misrepresentation of policies and things that are going on, you know, within our school systems and, and in other industries. Yeah. So that's something I know is, is definitely happening, but I'm staying on this because we have all this going on. And if we're talking about achieving a collective liberation Mm -hmm. that is cross-ethnic and cross-racial, how do we get to a place where, at least within the AAPI community, we we can address the intra-racial barriers that are preventing this coalition from happening? Because there's a lot of messages that are being put out there, you know, Anti-black does, does happen in AAPI community. There's that. You also have classism that happens, especially in the international space. So if you're okay. someone that spent time in a westernized country, whether it's the UK or even here in the United States, and then you come back to your home country, you're not looked at in the same way as those who spent their entire lives uh, within uh, the home country. So there is a difference in treatment there. So there's some th- there's some nuances to this. So I'm wondering how do we address the interracial conflicts that, that do happen, prevent us from coming together to achieve liberation as a whole? Um, I think the first thing is to recognize that there are educators and leaders and organizations out there that are already doing the work, cross-racial solidarity work. And just in the Bay Area, I know many, many folks and organizations, Hip Hop for Change, Asians for Affirmative Action, that for generations have been doing cross-racial liberation and alliance work to fight white supremacy and systemic oppression. And so the work is being done. And there are, I, I think that there are many people in you know the Black community, the Asian community, the Latin American community that have been doing cross-racial solidarity work. And it's really highlighting the work that's already being done and also teaching about the history of solidarity of our movements, right? And uh, I think not seeing our fights as individual fights that our communities are fighting for different things, but that actually our communities are fighting for the same things. Um, and, And I think your question kind of brings to light the the struggles, I think, in many urban areas like San Francisco, where the larger fight is around gentrification, corporate interest within a city that is predominantly um, communities of color, right? Like driving out affordable housing. And so in a city like San Francisco, you have a very strong um, Latin American community, Black community unfortunately, a a smaller Black community than 15 years ago because of gentrification and Chinese-American community that has been there for, you know, four or five generations. And I think that there are folks in those communities working in cross-solidarity. But one thing that I think you'd probably agree on is that, like, white supremacy is so, it's so insistent and it's so strong, right? It's so easy to sabotage that work. And it's so easy to drive a stake within our solidarity movements. There's, you know, one of the highest ranked high schools in San Francisco, Lowell Lowell High School. Last year, the school board just said that they couldn't use testing as a, you know, requirement for entry. It's a public school that uses testing for entry. And the Chinese American community predominantly didn't support it because it's been a school that has allowed what I would call like a, a meritocracy, ladder climbing, part of our population to say that, you know, it's our kids or no kids, right? And that fight has really been against 
predominantly the black and brown families uh, of San Francisco. But the ideas, the conversations that are happening, but are being overtaken by politics is really, we need to be seeing all of our students and all of our young people as all of our kids, right? And if one student is good at test taking and scores are high, we don't even know if those skills matter anymore. <laughs> right. Honestly, right? I can't even look my students in the face right now and say that going to college is going to help them be successful. And I honestly tell them that. I tell my own kids, right? Go study something you enjoy and enjoy learning. Go to community college. And we need to be much more self-aware of what our needs are in this day and age, what we'd like to see for our future, because it's not, you know, it's not this very straightforward equation anymore. No, it definitely isn't. <laughs> and since we are on the subject of San Francisco and, and standardized testing, right, I know that you spent a lot of time in San Francisco um, at the June Jordan School and just from what I've read up on it, I know that the teachers, the leadership there, they pride themselves on teaching children how to be critical thinkers so that they can be change agents in their community. So there's a strong focus on social justice. And it's not about, okay, we're going to just get ready for these standardized tests that are coming up in the spring. No, that's not the focus of what we learn through the curriculum and and just the work that we do, we're focused on the bigger picture, which I feel like is timely given what's going on um, in our country and even beyond that. So I would like you to just share a little bit about your time at the June Jordan School. Since you were there from the formative stages of the school as they were building their identity and seeing it to where it is now. So just, just talk to me about June Jordan School and just how magical it is, because for what I've read, it sounds like a dope school and I wish I had taught there. So yeah, go ahead. The floor is yours. I think being away for, for three years, I, I was there from 2004 to, to 20, 2019. Yeah. I, l I left in 2019. Okay. The years are, are becoming a blur. I, I would say you're right. It's definitely magical and nothing is perfect. There were a lot of challenges that we went through. The challenges, you know, were different from the formative years to, you know, the years from when I, I left. But I think it was truly a space that I grew and that I was privileged enough to be a part of. You know, it was a school that was started by teachers and parents and students. It was the only public school in San Francisco started from a grassroots organizing campaign. And, you know, I think Matt Alexander, Kate Goka, Shane Safir, Manny, just to name a few of the educators that were involved in starting the school. It was really from a lens that I, I try to look at things now. You know, we, we in school serve students and families. Right. We don't serve the student superintendent. We don't, in fact, even serve boards. We, we serve students and families. And I think that if you look at education as sometimes the only pathway to liberation for young people, young people spend most of their, our, their time in schools. And it can either be a place where your identity is being erased or it can be a place where your identity is flourishing. There's no middle ground. So either your identity is being erased or it's flourishing. And I think June Jordan was a place where educators and students could flourish. And I think there's something deeply liberating about kind of pulling the curtain away from understanding your own experience, right? Learning about systems of oppression but not only that, actually being able to take action in, in a way in your own community to create positive change. And so through many, many years of trial and error, we established a, a four-year program where students through internships and through service learning were able to kind of identify their personal passions and also create change within their community. For example, one year I had a group of students come to me and say, we're not doing a good job serving undocumented students. And at first I was like, oh, but we're a social justice school. Of course we are. And they were like, you're not. <laughs> 
And, and so just leading young people and being able to learn more about what they need, educating teachers and adults, but then going on and, and trying to make systemic change. For example, that group of students led by a student named Maria, who's amazing, wrote school board policy <clears throat> and ended up getting it passed so that all, all schools in San Francisco now have more funding to serve undocumented students, a dedicated counselor. And wow. so it's not all students do that. There's other students that make smaller changes in their community, but it's not really, sometimes it's not about whether you succeeded or failed, right? For us, it's about the praxis. It's about the reflection cycle. It's about what you learned about yourself. And I would say the other part of it is training adults to know how to be advocates for students. We can't be too hands-off, but we need to be supportive in a way that develops students' skills to be their own advocates, sometimes allowing them to fail, but then really being able to help that reflection cycle and using our knowledge to, to get resources, to get contacts, and to know that, that every journey for every student leader is going to be different. There's not like a straightforward formula. I don't know. Everything you describe sounds like a utopia, like honestly. Just the fact that the June Jordan School was a grassroots effort started by teachers is powerful in itself. And when you think about what's going on currently, um, especially here in our country, you have all kinds of laws and policies being pushed through state legislatures. They're saying, hey, ban books, focus on race and Ban books focus on banning critical race theory. Critical race yeah, theory. We don't even know what it actually really means. Right. And even with um, you talked about undocumented students, right? There's still a tax on the DACA program. So there are dreamers who are still fearing being deported with their families. It's still going on. And that's been a lingering issue. So with or a lot of times the parents are being deported, right? And, yeah. and the system, we served a lot, of, uh, quite a number of students who actually were living by themselves because their parents were deported. I think we lack the ability to, to humanize our policies because I think people look at them on individual, like what does it do for me, right? The American ethic of individualism is so strong that... When you even when you look at immigration policy, it's like, what are the immigrants taking away from me? Why does it have to be an either or thing? Right. We're the, the richest country in the world, but we're still thinking that we don't have enough. There's not enough. If, if there's enough for like them, then there's not enough for me. exactly. Exactly. That's crazy. But with all this going on. And with teachers quitting left and right teachers going to early retirement because they know that these injustices are there. I just feel like we're just at a tipping point in education right now. I mean, what is it going to take for us to really create a nationwide grassroots movement where we're pushing towards the direction of a June Jordan, right? And other schools with similar missions, because I feel like as currently constructed, our school systems and our public schools, it's very difficult to do the work that you're describing. Really difficult because of all the legislative barriers that have been implemented primarily by right wing and conservative politicians. <laughs> so where do we go from here as educators? Yeah, and I don't even think it's just right wing. I, I think the majority- oh, no, is. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, San Francisco <laughs> is a, a liberal place and it's some of the white liberals are just as frustrating, if not more for me. <laughs> I think it comes to understanding power as understanding community organizing. I think the only thing that makes change in, in the states is grassroots organizing, right? If you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, if you look at a lot of the civil rights movements in a true democracy, people really should have the voice. And I think the question for the next maybe decade is, are we going to continue to live in a democracy or not? But if we are, <laughs> um, I'm going to assume that we are. And if you look at power, it's about money. It's around policy. But I think the other thing is uh, it's around social norms and ideas, right? So social norms and ideas have a lot yes. of impact. And I think because it's invisible, 
it's difficult to fight. So there is still a pretty big social norm that um, students go to school and it looks a certain way and the outcome should be a certain thing and that success looks a certain way. And even though we have all of this information that says that our education system, especially the public education system in the United States was built for a world that doesn't exist anymore, right? Like the factory setting, people being workers in, in an industrial revolution type society, um, we still keep right. doing the same things. And I think we need, I think we need people with new ideas in positions of power because it really is about the money. Like when you, when you look at the way that public education is stratified in the U S it's controlled by state governments. And so doing anything nationally is almost impossible. And so you can see states yeah. who have more flexible funding models. And I would say actually Boston and New York are one of them are two cities and states that have a better more flexible funding model. And actually, when we were studying small schools, we actually went to Boston and New York to look at the um, plethora of small schools that actually have popped up on the East Coast kind of in the 90s. I think there's many models out there that support this type of alternative, passion-driven, liberating education system. But a lot, a lot of our money is kind of trapped into that public system, and it's getting drained it's getting drained more and more. I mean, California, I don't know if you know this, but California is out of 50 states. It's it's at the bottom. It's like 48th or 49th in, in funding per pupil. Mm. And the state serves, wow. you know, the, the highest amount of English language learners. Wow, 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 wow. We fund, not to get too much into politics, but, yeah. you know, we spend 10 times the amount building jails and supporting our military than in our education system. Wow, still that's still an issue, still a huge issue. I don't know how it is in um, where you've been internationally, but I, I think being international, you know, I've lived in Taiwan and Singapore, two countries which invest a lot in their their local school systems, right? And and I think I've experienced different types of governments. Taiwan is a democracy. Singapore is not. But two different types of governing structures that I can obviously feel that there is care for the citizens. And in America, you don't feel that there is a general care for the citizens by the government. Everything has to be a fight, right? Everything is has to come from the people. It's like the government doesn't see themselves as working for all of the people. There's not that feeling like you could go to any public restroom all across the world and by how clean it is, you can tell how much the government cares about its citizens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is what we call interest conversion. So for people that do read up on, you know, critical race theory, there's a thing called interest conversions where pretty much it's all centered around self-interest usually mm -hmm. white self-interest where, okay, mm -hmm. we're going to back up a cause that's being pushed by either people of color, whether it's LGBTQ plus community, because we know that in the end, we're going to be, we're going to be incentivized for that, whether it's in the form of votes, whether it's in the form of more constituents come next election, there's something in the back for us. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> And that's the impetus for our support behind a cause and a lot of that happens in politics unfortunately uh where we where you hear politicians make promises especially when it comes to education which they really mm -hmm. don't talk enough about every four years right which is why we need to focus on our states <laughs> and we right. need to really vote in our local elections but in terms of the federal there's a lot of just empty promises and we always find ourselves being frustrated, but it's like, it's Groundhog Day. Like, at this mm -hmm. point, y'all should expect to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't really... Yeah, and <laughs> I think the problem is also around the, the way that we talk about self-interest, right? Yeah. The, the way that we publicly talk about self-interest in the United States is that different communities have different self-interest and that we don't have a common self-interest. That cross-racial solidarity is actually being perpetuated when, 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 we t when we look at politics. I mean, it's getting more and more. 
Yeah, I mean, we're seeing that a lot. Self-interest in terms of, okay, well, there's a bill that's going to support one community, but guess what? We're struggling too. We have certain needs that have to be met. And that alone can cause a divide between cross-racial lines, across ethnic lines, what have you. So it's like an interweb of, of all these different things that's just you keeping know, us from having progress. There's a, a pastor that, that I used to talk to in San Francisco, and he used to say, they'll bring a small pot for us to all to put our hands on, hands into, to take from, right? Mm -hmm. But that white supremacy, huge pot over there, no one's trying to get to that one. We're, we're all trying to put our same hands into this tiny little pot, the horizontal violence that happens between communities of color. And I think that's a huge strategy of white supremacy. I'm telling you, this scarcity mindset, crabs in the barrel mentality, is, it's yeah. really harming us. It really is. And we, we got to get out of that. I think the other thing I'm seeing in international schools, too, is something that is is impacted students' mental health is that scarcity mindset. And our students, you know, in international schools know that they're competing for the same slots in Western Euro-American university systems. And so it's really perpetuated this, it's kind of ironic because we're, we're living within a, a, a very collectivist mindset, a collectivist society. But within schools, we have these this individual competition culture that has been breeded by the West, by our university systems from the West. Right. And it's, I, I guess it's mildly unfortunate, but it's hugely, I think, dangerous and toxic. And, and, it, and it goes back to what you said again about capitalism, how all these testing companies, whether you talk about Kaplan, whether you talk about ETS, they're getting bank off of students Pearson. who are taking... Yeah. SATs and ACTs multiple times because I know when I was in high school <laughs> 20 plus years ago you could take the SAT as many times as you want in order to increase your score because you were told in order for you to get the highest score possible take the test as many times as you need to but it's going to come out of your pocket no one was paying that test for you no, no, no one's paying and, and, for that test and none of those skills matter anyway, right? No, not at all. I mean, I do think it's, you know, the pandemic has really impacted us. But I think one thing it's done is is forced us to look at our, you know, the current systems we were working under. And I, I know that there are some universities that are dropping the SAT. And I don't know what alternatives there are. I know that there are groups of educators working on like this alternative transcript idea that um, that that would be really interesting but if we only drop test scores, then, you know, then I think that schools will find another thing to be competitive around, yeah. whether it be the grade point average or the, the IB test score, or we'll find something else to replace it unless we have an alternative structure that comes from a different type of idea, right? That comes from a different type of ideology. So let me ask you this. How do you feel about like summative portfolios, student portfolios of of their work and, and just their exemplars as a way, as a form of assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that portfolios are a great way to assess students. I think that with any type of more authentic or performance-based assessment, there has to be a way to do authentic reflection with an, I would say, authentic audience, right? So you know, at June Jordan, students would do a senior portfolio of work, but then they would exhibit their project, their action project. And we would take, there, there would be a community who would come in, it would be teachers, peers. Um, sometimes there would be some, somebody from that organization or doing work in that field, and they would present work in a kind of defense mode, Right asking questions, doing some sort of reflective inquiry on their actions, and then and then kind of presenting and talking about their project. Um, and I think those, a lot of people say, well, you can do that in a small school, but in, in large schools, it's hard. Well, let's make large schools smaller, <laughs> you know, or let's find a way to create smaller communities within large schools. I mean, if there's a will to do something, there will be a way to do it. 
I think that people lack imagination. Yeah. Or sometimes we're putting our energy into something that is not truly helping students, right? We might be spending a lot of energy as teachers doing one thing. We might be grading something, but if, if students aren't getting authentic feedback, then what are we spending hours doing? And I would think that COVID-19 has presented us with an opportunity for innovation, an opportunity to start anew and, and try out different things, explore. Doesn't it surprise you just a tiny bit that we're still, you know, holding allegiance to ideologies, pedagogical practices and, and principles that we know do not lead to student success, let alone whole school success? Yeah, I, I think I think we're all still in the midst of it. And kind of what I found even for myself is I turned inwards a little bit, right? Done a little bit more self-reflection mm -hmm. on what I need as a human <laughs> on this earth. I think we might see a little bit more action in the coming months or, or years. But I do think people have a tendency to want to ideologize a lot and then do nothing to change systems because changing systems is hard. And I also think changing systems sometimes is hard when you can't go out of your house. That's true. Especially now. Although, I, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to change. Right. But I do think it, it tends, it's, it's easy to have a zoom meeting and talk about ideas, but then I think we're having a lack of imagination of what types of systems can, can change. Well, given the circumstances we're under, couldn't resistance be a start for us? Maybe, hey, yeah, I don't I think feel like I don't, be quitting their jobs. <laughs> no, like maybe, okay, I don't I'm not gonna log on for this remote learning right. lesson. Yeah. Or I'm not going to come to school. I'm gonna yeah. Oh yeah. No, figure and out I a think way to, to pick it. Well, I don't know if we can pick it these right now because of just Omicron and the surge, but I feel like resistance is a, is a start. It's definitely mm -hmm. not the end, but it's a way to at least get things generated. Yeah. And I, and I think that we're seeing a lot of resistance, right. And yeah. I think people are quitting their jobs at, at huge numbers. I mean, I think that's great. I, I think then we need to go into kind of a strong reflective period and then think about what is the type of world we, we want to live in. But I, I think when we just kind of keep moving forward within that same system, it doesn't work. I think the other thing I've been kind of working on is we need to be organized in the ways in which we provide resistance, right? I think that's why I've been working with API educators online and within my own school teachers of color at the school that I'm at is that, you know, when you've been a, a minority in a predominantly white institution for a long time, you end up assimilating and adapting to the oppressive structure without even knowing it because you're just trying to survive. And so I think that, I think we need the numbers still sometimes in order to provide the adequate type of resistance that these strong white supremacist institutions need. Like I said, it's, it's powerful. Yeah, it is. And I think we have a great opportunity to do just that. And I think about this all the time. And I wrote a piece about this, this whole deprofessionalization process that's happening in our education space. I feel like as COVID has gotten worse, we're expected to do more, but this, like we're not given opportunities to really utilize the skills that we possess. Mm -hmm. There's less of an expectation for us to utilize those skills. Mm -hmm. And it seems like everything is starting to get automated. We're pretty much out of the equation. And it's led to a lot of people just saying things that we've heard for years. You know, oh, we're glorified babysitters or man, you don't really need a degree to be an educator. You know, you don't really need a whole lot of training. Anybody can do this. And I'm just like, man, it, it's mm -hmm. still it, it's happening more than ever, I believe. I mean, to the point now where if you go to Michigan, they have bus drivers, secretaries serving as substitute teachers. This was a law that was actually passed 
in Michigan because of the teacher shortage out there. Mm -hmm. That's what we've come to. (laughs) Well, I mean, and what I would say is uh, bus drivers and secretaries in some ways might make better teachers (laughs) than some teachers. Not to say yeah, that you, you just never know, skill, <laughs> right? But I, I think that's just a, that's just like how do you talk about a problem is so important, right? Of course, we want more teachers, and we want teachers of color, and we want teachers from the community that understand the Absolutely. students and understand the student experience. But I think in the West, especially in the states, like I felt respected for the first time as an educator when I moved to Taiwan. In the States, when you tell people you're either an educator or a principal, people are, oh, good for you. You know, like I'm doing unpaid charity work. And in Asia, y- you get respect. And it's not like I do this work to be respected, but it's a respectful job, right? It's a job that deserves respect. And I, I think it's also about where do we put our values? Our, If we put our values in young people, all young people, not just a particular group of young people, then we know that educators should be the most valued profession in our communities. And parents would know that. And and I think parents know this. They don't want to spend 24 hours with their children. And they know that teachers are the ones that mold their students the most. I mean, I have two kids and their teachers are very important. They spend more time with their teachers than they do with me. And so we, we have to start to value teachers. You know, teaching is the easiest job to do bad and the hardest job to do well, whether that be in person or on Zoom, right? So what you can do in person, you can do on Zoom. If you didn't have that relationship, if you didn't understand like your foundation for being an educator, then it's not going to translate onto the computer screen. But I think people are operating in survival mode. And so when everyone's operating under survival mode, we're just trying to like use the systems we have and keep our head above water. And when everybody's trying to do that, Ah, oh, we're all, we all drown. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty much, I mean, that's, that's where we, that's where we are with that. If you want to start a, a school, I've, I've been talking about this, you know, it's a lot of work to start a school from <laughs> nothing. I've done it before when I was younger. Um, I think I've learned a lot of things about what to do and what not to do, but I still have a dream of starting a school, whether it be internationally or in the States. So when we're ready. Yeah, I think it's the way to go. But like you said, it's a lot of work and you need to make sure that you have a collective. You need to make sure that you have a community of people who are just as invested in doing this this grassroots work. You got to make sure you have the people there who are going to be there from day one all the way through to whatever day the school is finally built and you start having children come in. But I did have... One more question before we get to lightning round because I know where we approach mm-hmm. the hour. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk about the bamboo ceiling for a second as it relates to mm-hmm. educational leadership with oh, yeah. um, Asian American Pacific Islander women, right? Mm-hmm. Two part question. Number one, does it exist with Asian American women? And if so, how are they being excluded? from educational leadership opportunities, whether we're talking superintendent positions, principalships, what have you. Mm -hmm. I think from, aside from, so yes, I, I think there is a bamboo ceiling. I think some of it comes from our internalized mindsets of who we can be as leaders and when we're ready. And I think that women in general, but women of color even more, We don't apply for jobs unless we meet or exceed every single criteria on that job description. We want to make sure that we meet it. And and I think a lot of that just comes from internalized self-doubt. But I think the other thing is then when we, you know, having been a principal and a leader in internationally and in, in the States, once we are in leadership, we're expected to act a certain way. Right. And that might be, you know, being a better listener or I think women in general are expected to be more caretakers 
as, as a leader than men. I, I worked for a long time with a with a great co-director at June Jordan, and he was a white male. And I could very clearly see the difference of expectations between pe people who came to me and people who came to him. I, I think we ask female leaders to be emotional caretakers in a way that we don't really expect of men. I think that takes a huge toll on, on women leaders. And I think it's taught me a lot about how to kind of separate myself and, and kind of draw boundaries. I'm a deeply empathetic person, but I think that I had to learn uh, when I needed to be deeply empathetic for myself as well. But, you know, I think there's the classic when it, I, I'm a pretty straightforward person. I actually am very comfortable with conflict. And so I've learned to not adjust for other people, but understand what people's expectations are of me and to kind of front load that. So, so it's not such a shock when, when I become more honest than people expect. I think one of the things too, surprisingly in Asian international schools is that you still have mostly white leadership. So I'm the only woman of color on an all white leadership team. And it's actually the first time that I've really ever worked in an all-white leadership team. In San Francisco, the challenges were different, but there were a lot of people of color in, in leadership and a lot of white allies. And I think that what I've spoken to about, too, is if, if schools are trying to do DEIJ work, your first thing should not be to try to diversify your staff, right? You need to do a lot of work on looking at the inclusivity of your culture, what it means to be inclusive, but also okay with not just a diversity of, you know, an outward appearance, but diversity of thought that's going to come with a more diverse staff, right? How do we democratize our communities? How do we deal with conflict before we think about recruiting or, or hiring for diversity? Because really, you're just inviting people into a burning building. And, you know, some people will be fine with being the token person of color. And, and actually, we, we do need people of color to continue to work in these white supremacist institutions. But we also need people to change these institutions from within. And we can't do that unless we build a culture, like you said, right, a collective accountability where everyone institution in the institution sees it as their job to create a different system. And I think more importantly, do the internal work, because even if you have a diverse staff, you have people, whether they're Black, Latinx, Asian, Indigenous, like they're coming in with those internalized mindsets. Because the reality is this, we went through school systems where the default was whiteness. Yeah. We internalize these notions, these biases. So we have to put in the work to unlearn these things. So it's it's more than just, all right, we're just gonna recruit and diversify staff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not- and I think that's why these conversations are important because I right. think BIPOC communities, we need to come together and also hold each other accountable for in, dismantling our internalized whiteness, right? It's It's hard to do that in spaces that are not made for us. Very difficult. And I, I think it, this is a perfect segue into the lightning round because I know we've been talking a lot about a lot of heavy issues. So now we're going to start decompressing, start winding down. I know earlier you talked about setting boundaries for yourself and protecting your peace. So I'm wondering, what are you doing these days for self-care? What does that look like for you? I think, you know, I'm in my 40s, so I've never been a person that cares much about makeup or dressing up. But actually, recently, I've, you know, decided to pamper myself a lot, get massages, put on a little makeup. You know, my husband was just here. He lives in a different country, so it's been really difficult for us. But I think when he was here, just, you know, going out to fancy restaurants, paying a little bit more than usual for, for a nice meal and just enjoying life, not feeling guilty about it. So yeah, really just trying to pamper myself. And when we look good, we feel good, right? June Jordan, actually, I had someone tell me that June Jordan used to say, like, you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. 
something like that. <laughs> and that is very true. So you mentioned your husband. I know your husband's an educator as well. So I want to know this because my wife, she's not in the education field. So when I come home and I have all these crazy stories about school, mm. I have to kind of provide some context around it. Right. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, give me one pro and one con of being married to another educator. One of each. You know, I was thinking about this and I don't know if it's because we've actually been apart for more time in recent months than ever before, but I couldn't think of a con. I think it's, I, I love being able to talk to somebody. We don't talk about education all the time, but when we do, it's, it, we know that it's something serious that we kind of need to help each other out with, right? We have a yeah. lot of dilemmas that... <laughs> just need some some idea bouncing. We've also gone through our own journeys together. We, we met when we were in our 20s, when we were both teachers at a middle school. And so I think we've actually been able to go, and he's, he's a white cisgendered male, and I think we've been able to go on an identity journey together in, in terms of being good listeners, but him also being very open to, open to understanding what it means for him right, to be a white male. And I think I'm lucky to have that type of partnership. I don't think we would have survived without that, without his humility and willingness to learn and listen. I think the con is our children. We have two beautiful children, girls who are currently girl identified that are reaching their teenage years. And I think they would say that they're sick of listening to us talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> So crazy. We said the cons of children. I was like, hold on, you don't love your children now? The way it's oh, no, I love out. my children. I don't know if they feel the same way right now, but hopefully it's a passing phase. You know, I, I think they both understand a lot about social justice, I think, even in their very few years on this earth. So I think that later in life they might understand the value of listening to us, but right now, um, they don't think it's very fun. Ah, uh, cool. If you can invite three influential figures to dinner, dead or alive, who would they be? Mm. I have read a lot of June Jordan's work. She's one of the most published Black American authors. I would love to talk with her. My grandmother is 96, and she speaks Cantonese, and I speak Mandarin. And so even though we communicate, it's, it's hard for, for us to really authentically have a conversation. So I, I always just kind of dream being able to have, you know, a deeper conversation with her. And, you know, recently I've been reading a lot about restorative justice. I think at June Jordan, we really try to put that into practice. And with the death of Desmond Tutu and his experience in South Africa with reparations, I know it was hard. And I think things like restorative justice is really something that you have to see and hear and listen to kind of think through challenges with. So I think he would be a great person to talk to. Awesome. That's a powerful table right there. And I'm going to give you this last question. Three words that will define your 2022. Start with me, just being concentrating on me and, and what I need. Fabulous, because I'm going to continue to pamper myself and authenticity. Love it. Love it. Lisa, Jessica, thank you so much uh, for coming on to the podcast. Uh, this is an awesome way to open up 2022. So I appreciate you. Thank you for time. having me. And um, before you leave, please let people know how they can connect with you on social media. Um, if you have your website, let them know how they can learn about your services and just all the great work you're doing, please. Yeah, my website is my name. JessicaWayHuang.com. I'm on LinkedIn and my Twitter handle is at Huang, J A Z, J for Jessica, A Z for Arizona. Um, I'm on, on Twitter and Instagram. There it so, is, y'all. Thank you so much. Make sure y'all connect. All right. And I know this is the beginning of the day for you, and you still have a lot of hours to go as I wind down. <laughs> It was a great start to my day. Thank you. I hope awesome. to connect soon. All right. We will. All right. Take care. Send my love All to right. your family. Thanks. You too. All right. Stay safe and healthy out there. All right. Same to you. All right. Bye-bye.
All right, people. So we're about to end another episode of I Name Talk for Educators Live, the first of many in 2022. And as I always tell you all, I'm going to wish you all good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world. And we're going to do this again another time. Peace out, everybody.